Oh yeah, that's not bad. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. We're recording? Yeah. Hold on, hold on. Action! I already did that. Oh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> How did we end up going to Sequoia? What was the... First thing? of all, it's been like, what, a massive heat wave? It's just, July was the hottest month on Earth ever, right? So that was one of the factors of why we're like, okay, where, where, where can we go camping? That's not Big Bear, because we've been there a million times yeah. at this point. So we wanted something with the campsite with elevation. We wanted something where it was kind of woodsy and do you see all of our videos? It's always deserts. We wanted something different, a change of pace. The other reason why we chose this area was its uh, proximity to the national parks. And um, we, so we stayed in Sequoia National Forest, which basically surrounds Kings Canyon and Sequoia National Park. So. What are some of the differences? Why is one a national forest and one a national park? What's that all about? That's why I bring you, dude. I really don't know. <laughs> oh. The national parks are sort of in the center and are surrounding them is Sequoia National Forest. Basically the difference is who runs the land, like who deals with the land. So the National Park Service is a little bit stricter, you know, because they have like the most pristine, most beautiful sites to see. So they have a lot more rules as a result. Um, you can only camp in the designated campgrounds, which are always like reserved years in advance and really hard to get into and then very crowded as well. But they also have all these like great sites to see and definitely like where you wanna go in terms of what you're gonna be doing during the day. The National Forest on the other hand is managed by the National Forest Service and they use the land for a lot more things. So they're gonna be having logging operations it's possible that they're grazing cattle on that land like you're going to see a lot more things happening on the land but you're allowed to do more so you're allowed to do dispersed camping which is basically the ability to camp wherever you find a campsite versus going to a very specified campground and that's what we like to do because typically like in your designated campsites they kind of fit you like sardines in a yeah. lot of different times and i just don't think that our group is well suited to be with the public, honestly, I guess. So, uh, yeah. our typical group. Where's your mask? <laughs> get that money, get that flame, get that money, baby. Don't stop taking pictures, dude. I don't like, like, I don't like it. Yeah, our group is, uh, our group is not so um, quiet at night. We don't want to be around disturbing other people. Um, and also, we don't want to, like, sacrifice the fun yeah. just because we want to be respectful of everybody around us, and so we just make sure there's no one around us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Don't you forget it. Here at Rex Kwando, we'll teach you how to fend for yourself and nature. Bow to your sensei. All right, so Brad, when we were trying to find our campsite, what was sort of the factors into trying to find that perfect area that we're looking for? Yeah, so the factors are away from a lot of people, wanted to have some hiking trails or something cool nearby. And in order to find our campsite, we usually use a lot of tools like Gaia GPS, Google Earth. And this trip, we actually were calling the ranger. So I was calling the ranger, I usually always call ahead to find out what the campfire conditions are, like are you allowed to have a campfire? In this case we were, but it had to be above a certain elevation. And so we were looking for campsites above that elevation that were dispersed, that wouldn't have a lot of crowds. And uh, the ranger told us about a couple Jeep trails that would be good if you have a high clearance vehicle like we do. And he said that because of the challenges of the trail, there wouldn't be a lot of crowds out there. And then he mentioned another road that was not challenging, but it was really scenic, very beautiful because it was right next to a creek. But using Gaia GPS, we saw the road crossed a creek a, a few times. And then using the coordinates where it would cross, we put that into Google Earth. And we could see uh, in the satellite image where there's likely to be campsites because there's big openings. Sometimes you can even see campers there. And in this case we did, so we could see a tent was set up. Yeah. You could see fire rings, you could see all of that stuff. And it was right next to a creek. This was the furthest out campsite, like in terms of driving that we would have encountered. So we targeted that one first and we figured if we don't make, if that one's full, if it's already got people at it, we'll just start cutting our way back to the park and try to find some sites. It was a really, cool drive getting out there and everything and it, it's interesting that sequoia every trail almost was seemed to be paved in some sort of way too and when we finally got out to that one road that just opened up like it was all dirt it was um you know underdeveloped 
I guess you would say, and like last 10 feet of that trail into our campsite, you definitely need four by four because it was like a, you know, 30 inch oh, angle yeah. kind of sloped down and, and uh, to get up there with like a, a Subaru or a Prius or anything like that, you're, you're definitely not gonna be able to. Yeah, all the way out there, you probably could have got the Subaru yeah. like to the place, but then once you had to go down that hill. Yeah, so tell us about showing up at the campsite. It was very unique, our campsite in general. So we had a creek that was right next to it, and then we had open spaces. There was a fire pit. Actually, there was two of them. Mm -hmm. um, and then in general, we also had um, a picnic table, which again, is very rare yeah. every time we go camping, um, and just a, a couple of wide open areas. But uh, as it turns out, some of those areas, when we originally parked our cars, we had to reshuffle because we noticed that some of those trees didn't look too inviting. Yeah, um, there weren't very many flat spots at the site. There was a lot of like off camber site, which is fine if you're in a vehicle because you can easily like um, drive up on some rocks or something to level out. But we had some folks with tents, so we really needed those flat spots. Yeah, and they were marked. So, you know, I think we made the assumption that those markings mean you're dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, yeah, we talked about it because the markings could have been the trees that survived getting cut because they were safe and they were strong enough to stand up. And so the Forest Service decided to let them be, or they could be marked because they needed to be cut down. And so we erred on the side of caution and like decided that we weren't <laughs> to risk it. So anytime that they're gonna cut down a tree, they mark it to, to show that it's coming down. Um, well, I mean, I don't know if this is what this is for sure, but every dead tree in this area that looks like that basically has a blue spray paint on it. There's a grove of them over here. There's like four or five dead trees and they all look like that. They all have that blue. So we kind of just assume that means that this tree is going to come down eventually. I mean, it could mean it's safe. I would say out of all of our campsites that we've ever been to, that one has, I think that one is my favorite. Yeah. Like just because of the offerings and, and just the way everything worked out, right? So we had one person that entire three days that we were there. Just we saw through. no people. Big Bear, whenever you're there, you hour one, you get a <laughs> truck full of Jeeps yeah. passing you like by. Like kicking up dust into it, your campsite. Exactly. And stuff like that. So, that was perfect, right? Yeah. And and that guy ended up going away anyway. But there was a lot of hikes that we were going through in that trail and Heather Creek as white noise, fantastic. I was yeah. able to sleep like a rock. It's like sleeping next to a giant white noise machine. Yeah. Basically. So the hikes around the trail, there was like old fire roads or old trails that like are not used anymore that yeah. you could walk around on. Our Second day there, that's all we did all day. We just got up and went and hiked around the campsite, climbed up some cliffs and stuff like that. Yeah, the, the creek was cool, so I don't know. I didn't get in it, I did touch it, but I think ever since I saw this documentary that like there's like little bacterial in, in water, I just don't want to go anything. <laughs> like, to be fair, sure it's safe. Yeah, it's probably 100% safe. Yeah. Um, there's not any flesh eating bacteria, I don't think, in the Snow melt from if you <laughs> live in Houston, that will be <laughs> your other which okay. I that's that's where I'm from. So. Yeah, yeah, all right, so I see. But yeah, no, the water was freezing cold. That was the main problem with the water. It was snow melt, so it's like barely above freezing temperatures. Right. Um, and it's the type of cold that just hurts. Um, it's not very cold. Do you think that water's safe? Oh, it's cold. Oh, it's cold. Oh, yeah, it's okay. just snow melt. You dunked your head right into it. What, what would you think that water, what the temperature was of it? I'd say probably 32.5 degrees. <laughs> it was freezing. And then Connor and our group really wanted to go swimming in, in that water. And He got in, like he got in pretty deep, lost a shoe <laughs> along the way, but. The, the, the irony of it, it was a Homer Simpson sandals. So. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, <laughs> it makes sense. I wouldn't call it ironic. I would, it, it's just the way it should be, I think. Yeah. <laughs> what are the things that draw people out to 
Sequoia? What are the, like, if you're going out there, what are you going to see? I mean, it's just historically known at this point, right? When we went to the actual hike, like in Sequoia National Park, there was nothing but tourists there. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, it was night and day difference between our experience and then going to like the public places where it's just, yeah. you can't get parking past 10 a.m. Oh, that's a really good point. We were camped maybe 45 minutes away, which is a good distance. We were pretty far away yeah. from the park and we got up super early to try to do your sightseeing. I think that that's kind of the plan. Find a dispersed campsite in the national forest just outside, wake up early, pack up and go sightseeing in the national park. Try to get in there at the latest by like nine because by 10, there was no parking. Yeah. yeah. That place just fills up. No, I mean, we got there, there was just tons of spots. And by the time we were done, like maybe an hour or two later, everybody was hunting us for our own spots. Yeah, yeah. We got some recommendations from people who've been to Sequoia already and going to the Sequoia National Forest and, and the National Park and getting able to see those endangered species of trees, it's awesome. Yeah. Right? It's it's definitely breathtaking. It makes you literally drop your jaw and say, wow. 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 So yeah, you're going down uh, the General's Highway, which is one of the main roads in Sequoia National Forest. And then you pull off on to Wolverton Road. And I think there's signs for Congress Trail or, yeah. or General Sherman. And then that'll lead you, follow the signs that'll lead you directly to the parking lot. And you were saying like, you can't really see any of the trees from the parking lot, but you go down some stairs and then you get down into this grove. I, I will say too that those stairs are no joke, that there's people who got really winded and they're not even like out of shape people it's just like you will on your um, way back out yeah, yeah. You, you will feel it for yeah. sure first big tree that you see is general sherman which is the largest tree by volume ever, ever in the world yeah in the world it's it's absolutely massive thick boy yeah <laughs> um, that one is and then you can walk around we took congress trail which takes you around and they have lots of different little areas, some burned out trees, some hollowed out trees that you can like fit a car in. They're absolutely massive. Just a real beautiful hike around and then some groves where there's lots of them like grouped together and they, they call it like the house and the Senate yeah, and stuff like that. Everything is like politically themed or congressionally themed names for all the trees. But I, I think it's one of those walks that it's like walking into a different planet or like back in time or something like that. It definitely feels like you're on the set of a movie. Definitely worthwhile and something that I really encourage everyone to kind of do. It was it was awesome. Some other things to see out there. Um, there's Moro Rock. Yeah. Which is a really short hike, but it's like along this uh, big rock face. Um, it gives you really awesome views over the park. I think it's only like a half mile out and back, but um, really cool views. So Sequoia is like southeast of Kings Canyon. And if you go up Northwest to Kings Canyon, um, there's General Grant um, Village. And General Grant is the somethingest tree. It's a good tree. <laughs> it's the goodest tree. <laughs> General Grant tree is the second largest tree next to General Sherman. So it's just another big one. In Kings Canyon, there's other groves that you can go hike. I think Kings Canyon is like a lesser traveled one. The roads that we took in and out, just they were scenic itself. Yeah. I don't think that it's possible to take a bad picture anywhere out there, honestly. Yeah. Like, it's just impressive wherever you go. Brad, when we do our camping trips, we typically have like a Google Doc and then we try to find out like how to basically plan the entire trip. So what's kind of the, the lay of the land in terms of how do we get everything set up and know what to bring and everything as well? So yeah, we keep a spreadsheet. I think we, we started it once like five or six years ago and have just been sort of building on it ever since. It's basically just a list of every piece of gear that we have. And mustard. And includes mustard. It includes, <laughs> and, it, and it's broken out by th like three uh, different things. So there's like all the details of where we're gonna be stopping. So anyone who has it can click on those locations and open up the map. It's like links to Google Maps or whatever for all those spots. We'll put like everyone's phone numbers and stuff like that in there in case you need to get a hold of somebody. Not everyone that comes with us needs to bring everything, right? So you and I collectively have 
two full kitchens, tables, chairs, and everything else. But everyone we, that comes with us, we ask them to bring like their own water, their own shelter, and uh, sometimes their own food, depending upon what the food situation is. Right, dietary restrictions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, this just helps us keep track of like who's bringing what, so we make sure everything's at least covered. I think that's the issue that I have, is I typically don't look at it half the time. Yeah, it will never cease to infuriate me. <laughs> like how there is a sheet that has everything and you completely ignore it every time. I just get really busy and uh, it's just hard for me to open a doc sometimes. Yeah. Can you convert this PDF and print it out for me? Because I don't know. Yes, what to do. you just print it. That's all you have to do. <laughs> Bears. 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 Yeah, there are bears out there. They're the black bears, so they're the less aggressive kind. The main issue that you'll have is that if they if you leave out a lot of food or trash or something like that, then they're gonna be attracted to it. You can probably scare them off if they do come into your camp, but like who wants to deal with that? Didn't see any bears, didn't see any scat tracks, um, no little bears, so like raccoons, rats or um, possums, skunks, or anything like that. Just like a, a lot of ants and uh, a, lot of ants. a boot in the tree and that's it. What was your favorite part of the trip? I really liked the fact that there was a creek nearby. You just don't get that everywhere. The noise is pleasant. It's the nice to have the white noise of the creek. But then also when it gets hot, you can like splash the water on you and yeah. cool down a little bit. That was just a really tame, easy trip to do. What it is too is that because it was paved and there are a lot of visitors there, I feel like you feel safe 100% of the time. Yeah. Right, so Death Valley was completely different, right? You're just off camber, off road, in the middle of a place yeah. called Death Valley. Yeah, and um, you're hundreds of miles away from a hospital or anything. Right, right, yeah. so like that one was a little more dangerous and rigorous, I would say, but this one was just a ballpark. It was super easy and I think anyone can do it. Yeah, no matter what vehicle you have, I think that you could call the ranger, talk to them, tell them what you're looking for, tell them what you what vehicle you're driving, and they'll be able to set you up with some specific trails to go look for sites on. If you have a even like a stock Wrangler or for Forerunner or something like that, you're gonna be able to do mostly everything that's out there. I agree. I, th I don't think that there was much to it. It was a super easy trip and they made it super accessible for a lot of different people. Where should we go for our next trip? I would go back, actually. I would go I back to Sequoia too. and I'd just go do see the sites that we didn't get to see. It seems like there's probably at least two or three more good days of stuff to see it easily two or three days, maybe even more, that we haven't even seen yet. And you yeah. can pack those days full of stuff to do. I'd argue that you can spend a week there and you can still be short of seeing a lot of different yeah. things. Yeah, for sure. Well. Thanks guys, like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. <laughs> yes, queen, I'll be right there, baby. I just want to talk to my, my fans, okay? Don't forget to smash that like and punch that subscribe because your boy will be coming at you live from here to f***ing eternity. Camera's off!